thanks everyone uh, for having me. Um, I uh, literally got back to Australia from Canada about three or four months ago, so I kind of uh, when when I was allowed back in, um, <laughs> and uh, so it's a real privilege to come and um, chat to everyone today. It's uh, we've got some exciting things on the horizon, so um, I just want to tell you a little bit about that, if that's okay. So. I don't have any disclosures. So today um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction to epilepsy surgery and some of the things that I learned um, whilst I was overseas. I worked with a very, very, very subspecialized unit, um, one of the kind of world leading units. Uh, a lot of world leading research has come out of that area. So I'll talk a little bit about that, a bit about epilepsy surgery. Um, as I said, my Canadian experience, some of the uh, the different techniques that um, I've brought back to Western Australia, and then hopefully some future uh, things on the horizon. So just a little bit about me, one slide. Uh, I was born, raised and educated here. I went to medical school at UWA and I did uh, neurosurgery training as part of that. It's an Australia-wide training program. So I did that in Perth, Sydney and Wollongong. And then I went to do um, a pediatric neurosurgery fellowship at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Um, I worked with uh, some great epilepsy surgeons over there, um, uh, Virginia Maxner and Alison Ray. And um, uh, then I proceeded to go to Canada where I spent a year in Toronto doing spine surgery. And then after that, um, more recently, I was in a place called London, Ontario, and people often refer to it as the fake London. Um, so it's London in Canada. It's 200 kilometers west of Toronto, but it is the biggest epilepsy surgery unit in Canada. So that's kind of where what uh, took me there. <clears throat> so basically, um, I want to talk about what the lessons that I've learned um, moving forward. Uh, so that's London, Ontario. Um, that's that's actually a picture from the tourism website. It hasn't come out that well, but um, the place actually looks a lot worse. Uh, <laughs> and uh, for a lot of the time, it's covered in snow. Uh, there's coyotes hanging around. Um, apparently, uh, one of the biggest uh, drug problems as well in in Canada as well. So it, uh, but. Very, very good work that we did there. And um, you can see it's right at the kind of southern border. It's actually in between Detroit and um, Toronto. So um, they were nice going for weekend trips to uh, Detroit. Um, Detroit's actually a great city. It's um, uh, I went for a few ball games there, baseball, got into that. Well, I like cricket better. But... Um, so, so the unit itself, um, it's very high volume. Um, they probably do about 150 to 200 uh, cases a year. There was a mix of both um, adult and pediatric epilepsy that I did over there. Um, they had quite established referral patterns, um, very high quality research um, with, that has genuinely advanced the field. Um, I'll allude to that a little bit later. And um, some of the stuff that I am involved with still with them research wise, um, uh, they got a really, really good team there. Um, of course, it's not just about one individual or one specialty. It's about collaborating with the neurologists, the neuropsychologists. The, the surgeons are just one um, uh, cog in this big wheel. And they, uh, it, it was actually, they, they genuinely liked each other. Um, they went out for beers afterwards and things like that. Um, John and I haven't got to that stage yet, but ho hopefully... Hopefully we'll get there. Um, and the important thing is they receive referrals from all over Canada. So um, we kind of saw all the difficult cases, which was great. Um, they've undergone a big learning curve over there. And it's nice to learn from somebody else's learning curve rather than your own. You're always going to have your own. But um, And they've also helped develop epilepsy programs worldwide. So they actually have gone out to South America to kind of um, countries that are a little less fortunate, like Peru, they're going out to Ecuador and establishing epilepsy surgery programs out there. Oops. So uh, I don't need to tell you or what epilepsy is, but um, essentially a majority of patients, as we know, are controlled with medication. But it's really that that tip of the iceberg or that medically refractory patients that are surgical candidates. And it's a subset of those medically refractory patients that are <clears throat> potential surgical candidates. 
I've got Canadian numbers just because I've kind of given a talk in Canada, but like their population is around 38 million. They have about 250,000 patients with epilepsy, of which about 20,000 are, are surgical candidates. And the Ontario province or Ontario kind of state, the, the equivalent where, where London is located, has a population of about 15 million patients. And they worked out there's about 9,000 candidates for epilepsy surgery in Ontario, um, of which only two main surgical centres uh, support this, one in London and the other in Toronto. And, um, and there are about 200 adult cases and about 50 paediatric cases done per year there. But at that rate, that would take 36 years to clear the current cohort, um, just even uh, if they didn't add any more patients onto the list, and obviously more patients add up. So it's a big problem, um, and it's also a problem here. So what about here? Um, I don't know the numbers, but based on Canadian numbers, which is similar demographic, there should be around 1,000 to 1,500 neurosurgical patients uh, or surgical candidates for epilepsy or should be at least looked at in Western Australia. And that's going to be served across, um, uh, obviously, the private sector. There are some surgeons there, but also, but mainly the public hospitals, of which is Sir Charles Gardner and uh, Perth Children's Hospital, from a neurosurgery point of view. So who is a surgical candidate? Um, I like to break things down and I'm a pretty simple person. I'm nowhere near as smart as my neurology colleagues. So basically it's patients with either partial or focal seizures who are drug resistant. And their traditional teaching is, um, you know, at least from a surgical world is consider those patients that have failed two or more medications essentially. Um, oh, just a bit of a preface. There are gonna be kind of live surgery videos. So if there's something, anyone's a bit queasy, just look away. Um, uh, I might look away. Um, <laughs> so we need to ask ourselves basically in surgery, what part of the brain are those seizures coming from? And will the patient be okay if I remove that part of the brain causing the seizures? So can we go from having a normal temporal lobe, which is just here to, well, sorry, a, a, a temporal lobe that is the focus of the epilepsy to not having that part of the brain causing the epilepsy and the patient still be intact. So that's our major goal of surgery. Remove the seizures and leave the patient intact. So what does epilepsy surgery entail and what are the different types of procedures that we can do? So part of the investigative process, which I'll go into, is um, uh, the use of intracranial EEG. And that can be done in either the form of subdural electrodes, which we do, we've been doing for a number of years here in WA, or stereotactic EEG, which is a, a procedure which I've learned and hopefully will be getting up and running um, soon. So, and then we go on to trying to um, improve the epilepsy. So that's with resective surgery. So in the form of either a lobectomy and depending on which part of the brain, most common the temporal lobectomy, but other um, procedures including, including lesionectomies, um, tumor related epilepsy, um, uh, things like subpeel resections, hemispherotomies or hemispherectomies, corpus callosotomies or disconnection procedures. And then there are other things like radiation therapy or stereotactic radiosurgery, not so much used here in Australia, but more in uh, North America, um, radiofrequency ablation. I want to talk to you about uh, a bit later about laser interstitial thermal therapy. Um, it's something that's just recently being approved for use here in Australia, but um, probably has been used in the last decade or so in North America. And there are neuromodulative techniques like vagus nerve stimulation, which we've had for a long time, uh, deep brain stimulation, and more targets are emerging in the epilepsy side of things there, and responsive neuro neurostimulation. Again, not available in Australia, but I'll, I'll talk, uh, touch on that very, um, uh, very briefly after. So we know that surgery works in the right patients. And um, I alluded to research coming out of the institute that I was at. So this was a seminal paper about 20 years ago that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at temporal lobectomy versus medical management for temporal lobe epilepsy. And what it found basically was temporal lobectomy or surgery was far superior to medical management alone. Um, and um, nearly all papers have uh, reported seizure freedom rates of uh, around 70% at, uh, at one year in the right patients. Um, longer term, that does drop off a little bit, but, um, but it's still far superior to medical therapy. So 
how do we decide who is a surgical candidate or not? Well, it's a big team decision and it starts with um, our epileptologists. But for me, the decision is more important than the incision. And I think that's what my old boss used to tell me, and I'm sure he stole it from someone else. Um, but uh, it, it, it really does reign true for epilepsy surgery. In fact, um, even for stereotactic EEG, which I'll show you later, all my thought process and surgery is done before the surgery. And then that means when we're actually in the theater, it's pretty much on autopilot. Um, so the standard workup, patients obviously have to have a history and an examination usually a video EEG, some form of imaging in the form of MRI, plus or minus a neuropsychology assessment. That's kind of the bare minimum. But then I want to just talk to you a little bit about my Canadian experience, which comes into play um, now. So we did, the, we did the standard workup, which is kind of done in any established epilepsy surgery centre. And then we decide, you know, does it look like it's a surgical candidate or not? If they weren't... Um, uh, they may need to go on to do more advanced tests like SPECT or high fertility MRI. SPECT is actually very easily obtainable here compared to what it was in Canada where I was. So, um, but then, um, and then we'd go on to make a decision. But then there was this kind of patients where the data didn't quite line up or we're still wondering, you know, are they going to be a surgical candidate um, based on those non-invasive investigations? And then we'd go on to intracranial EEG. And there are a couple of forms of intracranial EEG. There are the subdural electrodes and there is also stereotactic EEG. Now, both have actually been around for a very long time. Um, subdural electrodes have been available here for quite some time. Stereotactic EEG, not so long. Um, it's uh, some a skill that, uh, um, as far as I'm aware, uh, I'm the only neurosurgeon in WA um, that's learnt this um, whilst overseas. But it's actually been around for almost 50 years, I'd like to say, in Europe. Um, and uh, um, both have their pluses and minuses, which I'll uh, I'll talk about. But um, uh, here you can see the entire head is shaved. Well, this is a, a traditional open craniotomy. Sorry for subdural electrodes. It's a, it's um, quite a lot more invasive than stereotactic EEG, which is just um, some some uh, burr holes with electrodes inserted into the brain. Um, this shows that the whole head is shaved. We actually didn't shave the hair at all um, in uh, in Canada. And I don't in intend to here unless anyone's got any special requests. Um, and there's always been this deba debate between subdural um, electrodes and uh, intracranial electrodes. Mainly in Europe, as I said, it was done um, uh, with these uh, intracranial, well, these depth electrodes. Um, and, but the US has kind of turned around and um, have moved away from the subdurals more to, to this as well. And I'll, I'll show you why. Um, so basically, these uh, surface electrodes are really good at looking at epilepsy on the surface. They cover vast amounts of area. There's still definitely a place for them um, in certain types of epilepsy. But it's really those kind of um, structures on the inside that we kind of want to interrogate and don't have a direct um, uh, uh, measurement of. And often it is those deep structures, especially in things like temporal lobe epilepsy, which are the, or what we call the mesial temporal lobe structures, which are the kind of epileptic focus or, or something that may benefit from surgery. Whereas depth electrodes go into the brain. Um, uh, they're very, very thin diameter. They go into, they can go, you can put it in as many as you want. Um, the average that I we were doing was probably anywhere between uh, 10 and 20, I think 24 was the most that I did. Uh, I did as little as six or eight in some patients, just depending, and it's all tailored to the uh, the patients um, or what we've we've done in the preoperative workout or what what we call where our hypothesis of where the epilepsy is coming from. So, so as I said, subdural electrodes provide excellent surface coverage. They require no special instrumentation. It's a standard craniotomy but they're unable to sample those deep structures. And I think for you guys as the patient, they're definitely more uncomfortable. Um, they also come with a bit of a higher complication profile, um, infection, CSF leak, it's a larger craniotomy, it's a longer procedure. Stereotactic EEG gives us uh, access to deep structures that which uh, we may not um, have with subdural electrodes. 
it's good 3D localization, kind of gives us a, an idea of um, some of the networks involved, but it does, it's got poorer spatial resolution, so it doesn't sample as, as much um, of the surface in particular. And um, functional mapping or working out what um, era, part of the brain that's controlling, that's a little bit more difficult as well. But all in all, it's much more well tolerated, I think, for patients um, in general. Um, and you'll see, so this was, um, this was London, Ontario's experience. So we've got the years right back from kind of the early 80s, right up to kind of um, 2020. The orange represents subdural electrodes, and it's almost like overnight, kind of in 2014, they changed their mind and decided to um, almost exclusively go to stereo EEG now or SEEG. Um, and that was a combination of factors. It was probably a bit of new personnel as well as patient experience. Um, they also got a robot as well, which I'll show you uh, later, a surgical robot to uh, insert these. So. Um, there's no evidence to actually say, though, one procedure over the other is better at localising epilepsy. I think that would be quite a hard study to, to perform. But um, so, but I still think there's a place for both um, uh, and uh, it will be tailored to the individual patient. So they went through this learning curve, um, which I'm glad they went through because... Um, they trialed and they troubleshooted and I've kind of learned from their troubleshooting experience. So how to plan trajectories, how best to avoid vessels, how far to drill, what size of anchor. And, you know, they've, they've even got uh, spreadsheets already set up, um, which I've taken, um, which kind of kicked to all the hard calculations for me. So that's great. Um, and this is just a, uh, uh, um, a video of their procedure. And this is them doing it with a frame and the, um, they're drilling into the skull. They're measuring how far to drill with that ruler that pops in. This is obviously on fast forward. They insert an anchor into that area. They then insert kind of a passing needle to the target, take an X-ray and then insert their electrode, do another X-ray. And there's one electrode already placed in. And we repeated that up to 20 times or so per procedure, uh, per pay, um, yeah, per procedure. And then they got this um, robot, um, which was the, what we call the, this is called the Renishaw Neuromate robot. This was actually, it's, it's interesting in Canada, the government will give them a hospital, but doesn't really fund any kind of cool toys or products in it. So this was all um, gotten by donation. Um, uh, it's kind of news, it's common news. So I can let you know that it was actually sponsored by Domino's. Um, I think the Domino's CEO in Canada had a, a special place for epilepsy. And um, it's funny because we all, we all got free Domino's pizza vouchers um, every year as well. So, but this was the Domino's robot. Um, uh, so so uh, they got a robot. Um, and what the robot does is um, actually doesn't necessarily improve the accuracy, but it definitely improves the time. So what uh, the red, the red uh, line down the bottom basically shows um, the time per electrode or the procedure, and the red line is uh, with the robot, and the black line is the traditional way, uh, way with a, a stereotactic frame, which is what you saw in the last video. Um, with the robot, all the procedure is planned beforehand. It's all done on the software, and often we got the most, well, in Canada, they got the most junior surgical trainee to do the operation because it was almost it was it was that easy because all the hard work was done so i actually ran the robot while we were away because that was actually all the work was done in um uh, positioning it and uh in fact the procedure itself took about an hour to an hour and a half whereas with the frame it probably took about five to six hours and it was mentally exhausting but the, that mental exhaustion, I actually took a hit for before the procedure because I did all the planning and that took me about three or four hours before case, but that was under, that wasn't, that was all done into the software before the patient was even in the room, sometimes planned weeks in advance. So, um, 
it was uh, basically, uh, you know, it was very stress-free at the time of the operation. And this is just a video of the uh, the robot. This is our robot. Um, so mm -hmm. my video from the end, again, sped up, not in real time. But you can see the, the robotic arm moves around. Renishaw is actually an automotive robot industry. So this was came out of the automotive uh, uh, robot industry and built on those principles. But basically... Uh, the robotic arm moves to each trajectory, and as I said, it's probably the most junior surgeon um, doing that. I'm out of screen. Um, it's basically holding a button, controlling this uh, this robot, um, and you know it, and it really becomes a well-oiled machine where we're putting each electrode in every three minutes. So if you times that by twenty, that's an hour. You want to do that on a stereotactic frame. Um, <laughs> You probably need a tea break in between for the mental gymnastics because you've di got to dial up every code. There's so many checks. There's checks with this as well. There are definitely safety checks, um, but uh, it's definitely easy. And we could often do two or three a day, um, whereas uh, over a, a frame, you could probably just do one a day. Another thing that um, uh, I did quite a bit was was uh, awake craniotomies, um, which again have been available here for a long time. Um, but they're often used to map out eloquent regions in the brain that can be preserved at the time of surgery. And it's usually motor or movement um, or speech mapping that we're doing. And what that tells us is to avoid those areas uh, once we identify uh, that. Um, it's often done in junction with electrocorticography um, where we monitor for epilepti epileptic activity. Um, we didn't do that a lot in Canada. Um, the neurologists didn't come to the theatre as much as um, we have the privilege of them coming uh, now, and it's great having that collaboration here. Um, and this has been available for many years in, uh, in, in WA. Uh, the frequency of us doing it in Canada was probably a lot more, um, often for what we call the dominant or left temporal lobe. We used to do all of those awake, and that was really so we could get, it, we got it down to a fine art. It wasn't a big deal doing it. Um, uh, it was almost uh, like there were multiple anaesthetists that were available to do it. Theatres were very comfortable with it, so it wasn't too much of an issue the more that you do. This is again is just another little video showing um, an awake craniotomy. Uh, it's from a journal, The Neurosurgical Focus. It's not mine, but there's a, a lesion in the back um, uh, of the left side, left temporal region there, the left temporal parietal region. Basically, they're doing an awake craniotomy with speech mapping. Um, and um, you can see here, they've got the patient. He's actually, so there's no breathing tube in at the moment. You can see they're registering their neuronavigation. They're putting some local anesthetic. They're uh, then drilling out uh, a bone window and exposing the brain surface. Um, once they do that, they put a, a grid on the brain to basically uh, uh, localize where they are. Um, and then they start their mapping procedure um, where they, you can see there's this, uh, oh, sorry, they've got this electrocorticography grid. This is their mapping. So basically they're, uh, they're testing areas of the brain while getting the patient to speak. They find areas of what we call speech arrest, where the where the the speech stops, so they know to avoid that because that's eloquent. And then they resect in an area away from where they've identified is um, eloquent cortex, so the patient um, doesn't suffer any deficits post op or that's or, or minimal de or minimizes their risk of deficit. Um, it's interesting, most patients do develop a def deficit after the procedure, and that's just from swelling of the brain, which is transient, and then it, it gets better after that. So I just want to briefly touch on some other techniques that um, I was involved with uh, whilst I was overseas, um, uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy and um, some neuromodulative uh, techniques. Um, so... I want to just talk to you about LIT or, or laser therapy. And this is really kind of an emerging, minimally invasive neurosurgical technique. And I really kind of want to watch this space very, very, very carefully. So basically what is done is a laser is inserted into the brain through a very small hole. It's minimally invasive. It's, com it's used as almost as, as an alternative to a big open craniotomy. And what we do is we thermally ablate or for lack of a better word, cook, um, the area of 
uh, the brain that's causing epilepsy or a lesion. Sometimes we use it for tumors. And this has gained a tremendous amount of traction in North America, um, particularly in the last decade. And almost to the point where you can't really call yourself an epilepsy surgeon in, in America without knowing this technique. Um, so, uh, as I said, it's put forward as a potential alternative to open craniotomy for, select, for selected type of epilepsy and brain lesion. And um, it's recently been TGA approved uh, earlier this year, so it's very, very new to Australia, although it's been around for almost a decade or so in North America. And there's this currently a, a major trial going on called uh, the SLATE trial or stereotactic laser ablation for mesial temporal lobe or stereotactic laser ablation for temporal lobe epilepsy um, and it'll be very very interesting to see uh, the results of this trial uh, it's basically comparing or to see whether laser therapy for temporal lobe epilepsy is comparable to open surgery uh, and the outcomes from that point of view so Basically, with uh, with lit, I'll show you a quick video. This is from the uh, manufacturer's um, animation, so it's very nice. But you can see it's um, a small hole is made basically um, with a drill. Um, after the planning's done all prior to, as I was saying, um, it, it's all done beforehand, so they know where to go with this. They basically place a, an anchor um, where. Uh, the entry point of the laser is going to go and they then uh, apply this uh, this cooling kind of sheath into the target of the brain where the epilepsy is uh, coming from in this situation and then they insert the laser fiber and, and this is what's going to heat or thermally coagulate the uh, the area of epilepsy and the patient then goes to an MRI scanner so it's you you have to have kind of an MRI scanner um, a laser fiber is then passed um, to the laser system the control system and then MRI is done and um, MRI thermometry or a thermal map is then generated from the MRI and then that's used to then transfer to the laser system and then the doctor sets the temperature and confirms the laser and position and then starts to ablate that area um, of epilepsy using the laser under kind of almost real time um, uh, guidance of the MRI at the time. Um, so you can see that uh, kind of, and the laser's kind of drawn back along the lesion um, to, uh, to uh, ablate that area of tissue. Um, and that kind of um, is done all kind of in the intraoperative MRI suite. Um, it's typically one stitch. Um, and these guys say uh, the patient walks out of hospital the next day. Sometimes that does happen. Yeah. Um, and almost. Uh, um, so I'd be really keen to see what the results of that trial show uh, to see if it's comparable to. Uh, and it, Really, you avoid the big complications of craniotomy or potential complications, infection, bleeding, stroke, um, or, or minimize them. Um, uh, you also reduce length of stays in hospital. Um, the neuropsychological hits from, from doing a craniotomy or, or sometimes um, they get a visual field deficit, things like that um, is all minimized. So that's why it's quite exciting. It's marketed quite a lot in North America, but it's... It's marketed for for other reasons, um, which may not be medical, but um, uh, but nonetheless, it'd be exciting to, to to watch this space. The good thing is about uh, at Charlie's and both PCH, we have intraoperative MRI facilities at both of those, and that's actually the harder thing to get rather than the laser machine. So. Um, the laser machine is cheap, comparable to an MRI. So we've already done the hard yards um, for that. We've already got that. And that'll be a great utilization of the intraoperative MRI that we already have. Um, very briefly talking about neuromodulation for epilepsy. So this is in the form of, um, uh, most of you may or may not be familiar with um, vagal nerve stimulation. Um, there is also deep brain stimulation and what is called uh, responsive uh, neurostimulation, um, which is not available in Australia. These are for really quite refractory patients. Um, uh, this table, um, you don't, it's just basically showing general outcomes, but it's probably 
effective in around 50% or thereabouts of patients across the board. It's broad brush start brush strokes what I'm saying um, for select patients it's certainly no no means a cure um, it's there to kind of hopefully improve quality of life in um, uh, for those really refractory patients so vagal nerve stimulation been allowed around for a very long time we did a lot of these in Canada for almost all our drug re um, uh, 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 refractory uh, epileptic patients, whether that was the right or wrong thing to do, I'm not sure, but we did use it quite a lot. Um, uh, deep brain stimulation, often been used more in the movement dis disorder spectrum, but I did quite a few of these as well for epilepsy, using the anterior nucleus of the thalamus as the target or the central median nucleus of the thalamus as the target, um, where, where pulses are um, sent to there via a neurostimulator. And then there's responsive neurostimulation where it's, this is actually quite an exciting area. Again, leads are placed into the brain. The brain waves are then monitored. Um, a detection of any unusual or potentially uh, epileptic uh, activity is then performed. And then it sends out a stimulus if it detects that. So it's quite a smart closed loop system and it sends out the stimulus to either prevent or terminate or, or help with a seizure. Um, again, not a perfect science by any means, um, still evolving, not available in Australia um, as of yet, but um, watch this space. So basically, in a nutshell, that's kind of the experience that I got, the, the things that I was exposed to. But really, uh, it was really about learning the experience. And, you know, beyond the surgery itself, it was um, about, you know, trying to develop a good uh, surgical epilepsy program and we've already got a, ver a very good one here it's about just trying to to modify that um, and move ahead um, and progress it um, and keep progressing it and striving for excellence so what do we need really we need patients obviously um, with intractable focal epilepsy which obviously there aren't uh, there, there's no shortage of that um, we need the epilepsy fundamentals which we've been, been doing a good job of management and workup the team, which I've already talked about, specialized training, specialized equipment and imaging. And then you can see the surgical equipment is only one little kind of cog in this entire wheel. And again, similarly, you know, what are the things that we need? What kind of personnel? You know, a, a neurosurgeon is only one of the many, many, many staff. The surgical kind of ways we do things, robot, laser, neuromodulation, that's one of many, many other kind of things that we need. So, so it's really just a, a cog in it, uh, in, in the big picture. So really, what did I learn when I went away? I learned technical skills, lobectomies, disconnections, VNSs, stereotaxis, robot, awake craniotomy protocols, uh, all the things that I've already spoken to you about. The non-technical skills, so decision-making process, surgical planning, how to work well in a team, um, uh, and how to kind of progress things forward. Um, administrative nuances, so like working with funding and hospital admin, um, all the red tape that we always uh, talk about, um, you know, trying to uh, educate the community um, and, and uh, establishing a referral network. And the other thing is resource allocation, and I, I bring this picture up for a reason. Um, so. Obviously, we, we don't have a robot here in Western Australia, uh, um, as far as I'm aware, in the public system. Um, uh, so I can't do those cool robotic procedures. We do have a frame that might take for a long time. I don't have a laser um, therapy here, but we do have an MRI. So it's kind of piecemeal um, and it's about trying to get things together. This here is actually uh, what we call a Starfix 3D printed M implant, which Hopefully, up uh, when we when we uh, get SEG up and running here is probably the the go to system that I will be using. So basically, a patient gets scanned um, with some special anchors in their uh, skull, and then we go off. We plan the uh, the stereotactic EEG procedure, and then we. Um, uh, this this gets 3D printed based on that plan in the United States and gets sent here and then they get screwed to those uh, anchors so the trajectories are already set um, and it's much less cost than the big capital cost of a robot. Obviously, ideally, I'd love a robot, but um, 
but this is kind of thinking outside the box and trying to minimize procedures, make, uh, minimize procedure time, make things easier for the patient and the staff. And we're already using this here for, for deep brain stimulation. So as a natural progression, using this for the stereotactic EEG, I think is probably the way to go un until we can hopefully get that robot. Because it's cool to have a robot, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And um, obviously a mentor network, and um, uh, I, I've, you know, it was a privilege going away. It's a privilege coming back. There are obviously giants here. You know, um, uh, John is amazing. Um, his wealth of knowledge. Um, uh, Gabriel Lee, the the previous surgeon here, I've uh, learned a tremendous amount. But also, kind of, it's it's nice to know that we're also connected. I have uh, very well, uh, good established now connections in North America, both in Canada and the US, um, where I can pick up the phone um, almost and say, "Hey, what do you think about this?" or uh, "Is what I'm doing crazy?" Um, so so it's nice to to. Uh, to, to have that connection and, and, you know, have Perth be part of kind of a global stage or be a part of that is, um, is or, or Western Australia is a, is a privilege, I think. So just on that, what's my wish list here? I'd really like to kind of make this a centre of excellence for uh, the surgical treatment of epilepsy, kind of, kind of inherently bring back some of those skills and, and, and continue to improve them. Um, We've already got world-class personnel, but maybe um, increasing some of our um, facilities to provide patients the best possible evidence-based management. Um, research and contri uh, uh, contribution to the scientific community. I'd be great if, if we can do more work and some of the work we do here helps benefit on more of a, um, a global scale as well. I'm uh, just on that, I'm doing a research project at the moment. Um, uh, I'm still doing one um, with stereotactic EEG patients. We had plenty, probably had uh, at least one a week um, over in Canada. So um, sometimes there were five simultaneously in the epilepsy monitoring unit at once with stereotactic EEG. Um, but I'm doing a study right now and those patients sit in the ward for up to two weeks, um, sometimes four weeks. We had one patient for six weeks um, uh, there waiting to have seizures so we can capture them and capture the data that we need. So they're bored. Um, so so I, uh, I started um, a meditation project. So they basically do a meditation, um, uh, one every year, uh, day, and we record their, um, their EEG or their SEEG activity to see if there's any changes. So there's plenty of scope. We have unparalleled access to the brain, um, so why not? And the patients appreciate that as well. Um, obviously, not everyone wants to do it, and that's fine. But um, you know, so there's a, there's an ongoing meditation project. That's one of the that's never been studied before in the world. So um, that'll be interesting to see. And um, obviously, it'd be great to have more resources here. So, you know, more epilepsy monitored beds, uh, more surgical equipment, um, right down from the planning software, how we implant it. I'd love to have a robot, as I said. Um, and I'm really, really keen on lit uh, or laser therapy if the evidence is going to swing that way and those results. Um, I think the preliminary results are very promising, but it's, uh, it's waiting for everything else to come through from there. So... Uh, my acknowledgements didn't come through. I'm sorry. There's a lot of people to thank. Um, and uh, obviously this can, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's all a team environment. But um, thank you for that. And um, if anyone's got any questions, please let me know.